Dr. Osge about the Mediterranean fever in children. Over to you, madam. Can I start? <clears throat> please, madam, please share the screen. Okay, sorry. Can you see? Yeah, it is visible. It is yeah. okay, madam. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very, very much for uh, inviting me for this lecture. I am really very honored to be here uh, with you. Uh, today, I'm going to present to you pediatric female Mediterranean fever um, for this lecture. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to disclose. So, uh, those will be my uh, objectives or uh, my road trip for this presentation. Uh, so first, uh, familial Mediterranean fever is the most common monogenic autoinflammatory disease over the world. Uh, the name of familial Mediterranean fever has been given to this disease because it is a hereditary inflammatory disorder, particularly uh, common in populations from the Mediterranean ancestry. It, uh, it usually affects the uh, population of Eastern Mediterranean people such as Jews, Turks, Armenians, and Arabs. The gene mutated in uh, patients of FMF is a Mediterranean fever gene, and that encodes the pyrin protein. The frequency depends on ethnicity, and it is estimated that one out of three to five uh, people in, uh, in, in uh, affected ethnic groups may be carriers for this uh, disease. Also, one out of 200 uh, people from these ethnic groups may have this disease. So, um, occasional cases are found in absence of known Mediterranean ancestry. Uh, and, um, uh, however, uh, patients from different ethnicities, such as uh, from Japan, Japanese people, are being increasingly uh, recognized. So when we look at the history, uh, in 1908, Genoa and Mosanta described a Jewish girl who had episodic abdominal pain and fever. Uh, although additional cases were described subsequently, nearly uh, it took half a century uh, to to the established as a middle Mediterranean fever. The first accurate description of FMF was published in 1945 by Segel. Uh, he described 10 cases and he described this disorder as um, at present little understood and often undiagnosed under the name of benign paroxysmal peritonitis. And the actual modern name, uh, Familial Mediterranean Fever, was first coined by Heller in 1958, who emphasized the genetic nature of the disease as well. So in 1998, mutations in the Mediterranean Fever gene, composed of 10, K 10 exomes and located on chromosome 16s, uh, were found to be associated with FMF. This gene encodes uh, a protein called pyrin. Uh, it means uh, in Greek word fever. And the other name is merinostrin. It means uh, Mediterranean sea in Latin words. So this protein is expressing primarily in the innate immune system cells, including granulocytes, cytokine activated monocytes, uh, dendritic cells, and cerozal and synovial fibroblasts. So this is the schematic representation of the Mediterranean fever gene and the encode pyrin uh, protein. So the, the most common FMF associated um, mutations are located in exon 10 and this exon uh, encodes the uh, B30 point to the, the uh, domain of the pyrin protein. <laughs> Up to date, according to the InFevers database, more than 200 Mediterranean fever uh, sequence variants have been reported. 
Uh, we know that not all mutations are associated with disease phenotype, and we call them the variants of uncertain significance. And with this description of new mutations, some uh, concerns rise about the necessity of uh, checking whole gene uh, sequences. But uh, they showed that screening the most common mutations instead of sequencing the whole gene appears sufficient to diagnose FMF in, uh, in especially the presence of clinical symptoms. So in 2012, uh, a group of clinical and molecular experts reached a consensus to, to set for a total of, uh, sorry, a, some microphones are open, I think. Okay. In 2012, a group of clinical and molecular experts reached a consensus to set for a total of 14 Mediterranean fever variants, if possible. Uh, these included the nine clearly pathogenic variants, uh, and most of them are located in exon 10 and five variants of unknown significance, which are mostly uh, located in exon 2 or exon 3. Uh, this protein pyrin has a key role in the innate immune system, as I uh, mentioned before, but pyrin is also detected in spleen, lung, and muscle uh, when leukocyte infiltration occurs. Pyrin colocalize with microtubules, and this suggests the potential effect of colchicine in uh, FMF patients. Pyrin is a regulatory component of the inflammasome, is also an intracellular pattern recognition receptor that assembles the inflammasome complexes in response to pathogen infections. And the activated inflammasome plays a fundamental role in fever, inflammation, and apoptosis. And this mutated pyrin causes an inflammatory response by uncontrolled IL-1 secretion. So uh, we know that inflammasomes play a central role in, in, uh, in the immune system. And uh, inflammasomes are a group of uh, multi-protein complexes. So um, we need a an exogenous ligands or host ligands to, to start the activation of pyrin inflammasome. This inflammasome's other name is NAPL3 inflammasome. So uh, after, first of all, uh, there need to be a, uh, an uh, oligomerization of the inflammasome. This oligomerization uh, usually starts the uh, assembly of the inflammasome complex. After this uh, activation, uh, this active pyrin inflammasome uh, induced the uh, um, formation of caspase 1 from procaspase 1. And this caspase 1 molecule starts the cleavage of pro IL1 beta to IL1 beta. And uh, when there is a mutated uh, pyrin or there is a mutation on pyrin inflammasome, and this is a, a gain of function mutation, there will be an excessive. Um, excessive activation of the pyrin inflammasome, and there will be an excessive secretion of IL-1 beta as well. So uh, some, some studies uh, published in the last few years about uh, discussing about the mechanisms of pyrin inflammasome activation. So they found that there is a, a molecule called rho A, which is located inside the uh, cell membrane. And um, this, uh, this molecule uh, star, this molecule uh, phosphorylates the, sorry, uh, phosphorylates the pyrin inflammasome. After this phosphorylation, uh, this inflammasome binds to the protein called 1433. Uh, and after the binding, after this interaction, uh, pyrin inflammasome becomes inactive. But uh, we know that there are some bacteria, uh, like here, uh, Clostridium difficile toxin, who um, who inactivates rho A molecule and also uh, activates the pyrin inflammasome. Uh, also, we know that Yersinia pestis, uh, which is a cause of bubonic plaque, 
has two toxins called YAP E and YAP T. And these two toxins also um, inactivate Rho A and also activate uh, pyrene inflammasome. So this is a kind of um, defense mechanisms of our body to those um, bacteria. But um, on the other hand, um, this Yersinia pestis has another toxin uh, called YAP M. And uh, opposite to its other toxins, this YAP-M blocks the pyrene inflammasome by, by phosphorylation and uh, makes an inhibition of pyrene inflammasome. So, uh, so we know that the, the uh, you can see here, Middle East was a major crossroads for, uh, for the uh, dissemination of uh, pandemics or epidemics. And, these well-documented stories of bubonic plaque epidemics over uh, human history raises the possibility that uh, Yersinia pestis may have played a role in selecting for the high prevalence of FMF mutations in uh, modern-day uh, modern Mediterranean populations. So this year in um, 2020, some experts from NIH and Turkey uh, published a paper uh, about these uh, mechanisms of the possible resistance of FMF patients or FMF carriers to uh, Yersinia pestis. So they found that uh, peripheric blood mononuclear cells from patients with FMF and uh, heterozygous carriers release increased amounts of IL-1 beta in res response to ex vivo Yersinia pestis infection. And that FMF knocked in mice infected Yersinia exhibited a survival advantage over knocked in of the wild type human uh, pyrene domain. Uh, so they showed that FMF associated pyrene mutations are um, associated with a resistance to YAP M induced phosphorylation. And FMF mutations that were, that were positively selected in Mediterranean uh, populations confer resistance to Yersinia pestis. Uh, this was really an interesting um, paper for this year. So when we look at the clinical manifestations, uh, the first clinical episode usually occurs during childhood or adolescent periods with 90% of patients having had onset by age 20. Uh, there is often a slightly modest male predominance, but we don't know the exact um, cause of this. Uh, sorry. And this uh, self-limited inflammatory attacks of fever and polycerositis with high acute phase response are a typical phenotype. These attacks can last to um, 12 hours to three days and usually consist of inflammation involving the peritoneum, pleura, joints, or skin, or uh, most of the times in a uh, combination. Between those episodes, patients usually feel completely well, and usually their uh, acute phase response, acute phase reactants are usually in normal ranges. So the frequency of the attacks can be variable, and the attacks vary uh, not only among patients, but also among episodes of the same uh, individual. There can be some triggers for the uh, start of the attacks, like menstruation, stress, or some infections can trigger the start of the uh, attacks. In nearly half of the FMF patients, there can be some uh, constitutional or physical signs before the start of the um, attacks. And these symptoms are usually uh, anxiety, irritability, or sometimes increased appetite. And the period between the prodromal signs and the onset of the attack has been reported to, to average nearly 20 hours to one day. High fever uh, is the most important symptom of FMF and one of the essential ones. Uh, in children, fever may be the only sign of FMF, uh, although other symptoms typically develop progressively over time. The fever is usually above 38 centigrade degree. Some non-specific findings such as weakness, fatigue, myalgia, arthralgia, headache, and back pain uh, commonly accompany high fever. 
in uh, abdominal abdominal pain uh, often accompanied the fever and uh, can range from mild discomforts and distension to severe pain with rigidity uh, it's interesting that the constipation is more common than diarrhea and sometimes in extreme cases there can be this can result in uh, paralytic leosis pain can be uh, generalized or focused in a quadrant sometimes can mimic acute appendicitis and um, patients can have a me past medical history of appendectomy and most of them are usually unnecessary surgery, but this uh, history can be a clue for us for the diagnosis of FMF. Uh, patients can have spinomegaly, hepatomegaly, intraabdominal lymphadenopathy during those attacks. Sometimes they can have irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, some patients can have complaints about causing intolerance, mostly uh, accompanied by diarrhea. This is very rare, but um, accumulation of amyloidosis in the small intestines can also result with uh, diarrhea and uh, mal malabsorption uh, in some patients. Pleural pain is generally unilateral, occurring with decreased breath sounds. Sometimes less commonly, a small effusion, uh, friction rub, or atelectasis may also be present. Uh, in musculoskeletal system, joint manifestations are uh, very common and uh, are sometimes the first sign of the disease in children. Arthralgia occurs more frequently than arthritis. Uh, arthritis in adults usually is monoarticular, but in uh, children, they usually have uh, involvement of several joints. It can be symmetrically or asymmetrically. They can have pain or sometimes large effusions as well. Muscle pain can occur in about 20% of the patients. Usually this pain is not severe, uh, especially appears in the lower ex extremities after some uh, physical activity, mostly in evenings and lasts from a few hours to days and uh, usually improves with uh, some rest and also non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, protracted febrile myalgia is an uncommon but very dramatic manifestation of FMF and uh, it's thought to be due to vasculitis uh, and uh, we usually treat this manifestation with corticosteroids. Uh, in this uh, situation, it's important to differentiate cautious induced myopathy from this uh, prolonged uh, protracted febrile myalgia. In a protracted febrile myalgia, patients usually have high fever, high acute phase uh, inflammatory markers, normal uh, CK levels, and uh, usually the evidence of inflammatory myopathy on EMG. P patients can also have axial spine involvement. In a study from Turkey, uh, nearly one, uh, 500 uh, FMF patients were evaluated by X-ray and uh, they found that uh, up to 10% of the patients have uh, uh, sacroiliitis with FMF. So 4% uh, of the patients have, nearly 4% of the patients have pericardial effusion during attacks. They can have pericarditis and usually uh, per recurrent pericarditis can be the presenting symptom of uh, FMF. Uh, pericardial, uh, pericardial attacks resolve spontaneously in almost all patients without uh, any sacella. Pa patients can have some uh, cutaneous manifestations. This is one of them, uh, erysipelas like erythema on the uh, dorsum of the foot or uh, ankle or lower leg. Sometimes uh, patients can uh, have some accompanying uh, vasculitis and some skin involvement uh, due to this uh, vasculitic manifestation. There are some rare conditions as well. Inflammation of the tunica vaginalis can lead to uh, acute scrotal attacks. Patients can uh, have uh, CNS, uh, uh, CNS in wounds, but this is really very rare and usually uh, there are some case reports about it. Some uh, observation studies have investigated the relationship between FMF and uh, multiple sclerosis. 
patients can have uh, headaches during their attack periods and eye movement is also very rare. Sometimes uh, patients can have uh, some uh, uveitis or papillitis. And also we know that FMF patients have a tendency to some uh, vasculitic uh, syndromes like Hennel-Schönner purpura, Bechet disease, or polyarteritis nodosa. They can also have a tendency to inflammatory bowel disease and sacroiliitis as well. So uh, amyloidosis is a very severe and also very devastating complication of this uh, disease. So the deposition occurs in several organs like uh, gastrointestinal tract, spleen, kidneys, or lungs, and so on. And we know that before effective treatment was available, renal failure occurred by the age of 40 in uh, many patients. There are some uh, risk uh, first of uh, one is a family history of uh, AA amyloidosis. The other one is the male sex. And patients can have an uh, alpha-alpha genotype at the uh, serum amyloid A uh, locus. Also, uh, I think this is very important. Uh, poor compliance of the colostin is a, a positive risk factor for developing amyloidosis. We also know that some mutations like M694V homozygous mutation might also make a predisposition to amyloidosis. And uh, the, the environment factors can also affect the development of amyloidosis. And early indicator of the impaired renal function is uh, microalbumin urea. So uh, periodical uh, urine samples uh, is very important. Uh, for these patients' follow-ups. And uh, after we, uh, we detect a proteinuria, uh, amyloidosis can be confirmed by a biopsy of the kidney or biopsy of rectum. Uh, on laboratory, no laboratory tests specific to FMF. Uh, we know that acoustic phase markers such as uh, ECR, CRP, fibronogen, and serum amyloid A are frequently increased during episodes. But the continuous elevation of these uh, serum proteins during and even between the attacks can uh, predispose those patients to development of systemic amyloidosis. Uh, diagnosis of FMF is usually clinically. So uh, we know that there are two very well known and validated classification uh, criteria that we use. One of them is Tala Schomer criteria. And the other one is the Alchinkaya Ozan criteria, which is uh, for pediatric patients. And in the Alchinkaya Ozan criteria, we have here a uh, fever, uh, more than uh, three or more than three attacks, abdominal pain, more than three attacks, chest pain, more than two, three attacks, arthritis, and also a family history of FMF. We need uh, two or more than two criteria for uh, making diagnosis of FMF. When we look at those uh, criteria, we see that they do not include any uh, criteria or any data about uh, ethnicity or uh, about the uh, genetic mutation. So recently, the uh, Eurofever uh, Euro um, group proposed new classification criteria for autoinflammatory rec recurrent fevers, and FMF was uh, one of them. You can see here uh, they made a combination of uh, ethnicity with some clinical manifestations. Also, they made a uh, combination of uh, genetic genotype with some uh, clinical manifestations. Uh, Euro, um, Eular made uh, uh, some recommendations, they proposed some recommendations for the uh, genetic diagnosis of uh, familial mediterranean fever. Uh, I want to go through some of the, the, the important points from this chart. So um, FMF is a clinical diagnosis which can be supported but not excluded by genetic testing. So uh, we know that homozygous mutation for M694V is uh, 
uh, with a very high uh, probability of a severe phenotype. And also patients carrying two of the common mutated LLs, um, either homozygous or compound heterozygous, especially uh, at the, uh, on exon 10, must be considered at risk of having a more severe disease. Also for individuals with two pathogenic mutations for FMF, but who do not report symptoms, there are, uh, if there are some risk factors for a a amyloidosis, such as the country that the patient lives or a positive family history or uh, persistently elevated inflammatory markers, uh, the close follow-up should be started and we must consider starting the treatment. So in treatment, the ultimate goal of the therapy in FMF is the prevention of the recurrent attacks and also amyloidosis. So uh, thank God we, had, we have colchicine and colchicine is the mainstay of treatment and uh, very effective in preventing clinical attacks of FMF and secondary amyloidosis. So the active compound was initially extracted from the Autumn crocus, here is the flower Colchicum autumnale. And Colchicum has been used for centuries for treatment and prevention of gouty attacks. But first, uh, in 1972, Goldfinger first described the dramatic symptomatic improvement of FMF patients treated with Colchicin. And in um, 2009, the uh, FDA approved causing more treatment of FMF and for other inflammatory diseases. The, the mechanism of the action is not fully understood. Uh, we know that it targets some microtubules and prevents the uh, microtubule elongation by binding to the tubulin monomers and inhibit the formations of uh, polymers. And we also know that colchicine is an activator of Rho A and therefore uh, suppresses the pyrene inflammasome uh, activation. Uh, we usually in children start the colchicine doses according to their um, age, as you can see here. Their daily dose uh, in adults, daily dose can be increased up to three milligrams per day, but in children, uh, we usually don't want to uh, exceed uh, two milligrams per day. And uh, also we usually recommend the uh, divided doses in children and uh, causing those shouldn't be increased at ongoing attack period because it's effective only if given prophylactically. And uh, we are really very afraid of the uh, toxic effects and also side effects. So when uh, we look at the side effects, uh, gastrointestinal system involvement is the most common ones, diarrhea or abdominal discomfort and nausea uh, we can see. So we usually start with a low dose and then increase with small amounts. Uh, patients sometimes can uh, have complaints about lactose intolerance. So we usually recommend them uh, avoiding uh, milk products for a while. Patients can have an increase in um, uh, an increase in uh, liver enzyme levels. We usually make some dose ad adjustments in this uh, situation. And it, this is very rare, but uh, we can see a um, uh, myopathy due to causing uh, treatments. So this is a progressive muscle weakness and usually generalized myalgia and increase in muscle enzymes we can uh, see. So we usually uh, stop the treatment or make some those adjustments in this condition. This is also very rare, but we can sometimes see leukopenia and thrombocytopenia in our patients. Um, Again, we usually uh, decrease the dose. So uh, we know that when we use it appropriate doses, colchicine is so safe and effective in treatment of FMF. But uh, there are some factors contributing to the inadequate response to colchicine. So these factors sometimes can be due to the colchicine itself or other inflammatory activity. Uh, patients can... Um, cannot tolerate the colchicine doses. They can have some, uh, some side effects or may have some other limitations. Uh, we can see sometimes some 
um, drug interactions uh, between the other drugs. And uh, the, the very important one is also the compliance of the patient is very important here for the response of coxin. And also some um, genetic variations like some uh, Mediterranean fever variations or maybe other modifier against that we don't know yet can uh, affect the response of causing. Also, there can be some environmental factors like their uh, diet or um, microbiota or some uh, infections can affect. Also, patients can have some uh, accompanying disorders, other inflammatory disorders like uh, spondyloarthritis or vasculitis. This can also um, affect the response to uh, causing. So recently, uh, Euler or the international expert group, Euler uh, has proposed a set of uh, recommendations for the management of female Mediterranean fever patients. Uh, I uh, mentioned most of them uh, before. Uh, they they, they um, underlined the importance of early diagnosis of, uh, early diagnosis of FMF uh, and early start of the cause in treatment. And also they uh, underlined the importance of compliance. So uh, compliant patients not responding to the maximum tolerated dose of cochicine can be considered non-respondent or resistant. And they recommend uh, some alternative uh, biological treatments in indicated patients. Also uh, they recommended not to stop uh, coaxing during conception, pregnancy, or lactation. And also for men, uh, they do not uh, recommend to stop the coaxing prior to uh, conception. So um, these recent guidelines from Euler and also uh, from other groups like French or Israel groups recognize that IL-1 blockage may be a second line approach for causing resistance or intolerance patients. So in this um, figure, you can see uh, some of IL-1 blockers uh, here and their mechanisms. So, Anakimra is one of them. Uh, it's a recombinant human IL-1 receptor antagonist. Uh, we can also use canakinumab, which is a human monoclonal uh, anti-IL-1 beta antibody. And uh, here is runonosept, but uh, we don't have, uh, sorry. Okay, can you see? Yeah. Uh, uh, this this uh, molecule acts like a, a soluble receptor and uh, binds to IL-1 beta and uh, prevents its own uh, interaction with uh, cell surface. Uh, we don't have relonocept in uh, Turkey. We usually use anakinra or uh, kanakinumab. And you can see here that uh, anti-TNF uh, uh, agents are also can be used to, um, to prevent this uh, signal transduction, transduction to, to inflammasome. So uh, another important thing is that these guidelines recommend that colchicine should be co-administrated with the IL-1 inhibitor. So this means that uh, we never stop colchicine uh, when we start the other uh, IL-1 inhibitors. And also, the, uh, we don't know the opt optimal use of these agents in uh, colchicine resistance FMF, uh, either uh, temporarily, periodically, or continuously. So uh, this field requires further uh, clinical investigation. And when we look at the outcome and prognosis, in the absence of amyloidosis, FMF patients have a normal life expectancy, and the, uh, the prognosis of the uh, compliant FMF patients is now very excellent because we have those uh, biological agents and also uh, biological treatments, including anti-TNF agents, IL-1 and IL-6 uh, blockers have been suggested to be effective in treatment of uh, amyloidosis. So 
this was my uh, last slide. I have some uh, thanks to my uh, colleagues uh, from my department in Hacettepe University, but I think my uh, first um, thank and my great appreciation is to my mentor, uh, Dr. Özen. Uh, you know her, but uh, she's really a very uh, inspiring, uh, talented and very outstanding uh, lady and scientist. And uh, I always uh, feel myself very, uh, very lucky that uh, she's my mentor. And uh, I want to share my uh, email addresses for any further questions or any further collaborations. And also these are some uh, beautiful scenes from my beautiful city, Ankara. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osge, for that excellent deliberation on familial Mediterranean fever. Actually, your talk reflected your vast experience in the familial Mediterranean fever. Now, uh, topic Sorry, is open I, for discussion. I should, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping the sharing here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is, there's a question in the chat box. I will read it for you. Uh, suppose if the need, if the ESR is normal during episodes, can we exclude FMF? Yes, we can use ACR and we can also use CRP as well for for the um, ruling out of the possibility of FMF. Usually, but uh, the, the the important thing is, I think, uh, if you think that this patient is FMF, you 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 have to check the uh, inflammatory markers maybe uh, twelve hours uh, after the start of this uh, attack. So uh, maybe your first um, laboratory parameters can be normal, but in in uh, in later you can see any uh, elevation. But if it is normal. So we can rule out FMF. Thank you, madam. Uh, actually, Dr. Kishore joined us from UK. Uh, how do you, uh, Kishore, Kishore, want to highlight a point? Dr. Kishore, okay. over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the wonderful talk, Dr. Basin. Um, this is a, uh, do you mind if I discuss a patient with you? Sure, please. So this is this young lady. Uh, so we've got a siblings uh, who are originally from Lebanon. Um, um, uh -huh. who is 17 now and a boy who is eight now and they both have um, uh, uh, mutation C21770. Um, uh, the family were in uh, Italy and they got it tested in Genoa and she was having typical symptoms and uh, her maternal uncle and aunt also have these symptoms and uh, she was beautifully controlled on colchicine um, probably having one attack, uh, probably having a, a symptom for one day in an year or something very well. She's doing really well in, and she's about to go to university. But about four months back, she started with a arthritis of her um, one of her elbows. Um, there was nothing else in the history, although there was a probably history of uh, a slight sore throat prior to the onset and her ASO theta was slightly high. So we thought it was a, a reactive arthritis, uh, but then the symptoms persisted uh, beyond six weeks. So we injected joined. Uh, it was a sterile um, aspirate and she responded very well to steroid injection. And two months later, she had two new joints. Now, previously, this girl has had no arthritis during the FMF episodes, but now she's having long-standing arthritis. Uh, my question uh, is, I mean, it's actually twofold. One is, is this likely to be a part of FMF or do we have to think about an inflammatory arthropathy alternate to the diagnosis? I know there's a lot of reports about FMF being associated with sacroiliitis and enthesitis and stuff like that. Yes. And, and, and the second question would be, if that is the case, what would be the treatment strategy uh, for this patient? Would it be anti-IL-1 or would we start them uh, methotrexate like we use in normal inflammatory arthropathies as first line? Thank you. Okay, so... Um... Any back pain or? No back pain at all. So she's got no tenderness over sacroiliatic joints and her okay. Schrober's test is negative. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think this is not a uh, arthritis of FMF. It seems like this is the arthritis of any other um, uh, concordant uh, inflammatory uh, disease. Like I think GIA can be um, 
the diagnosis in this case. Yeah, and we were thinking about I GIE think and trying to manage her. Yes, I think I will go with uh, like uh, managing or treating a, um, arthritis like methotrexate and but uh, I, uh, I wouldn't stop colchicine. Uh, maybe colchicine plus methotrexate uh, will work. Yeah, so that was the question I was about to ask. So we were planning to manage her as JA and start her on methotrexate. I presume there is no contraindication of using methotrexate along with colchicine. No, no, there is not. Yeah. And colchicine has worked really well uh, for should, her symptoms. Of course, you should um, check the um, liver enzymes. Yeah, yeah, we check the sure. liver enzymes every three months in her anyway. And, yeah, yeah, um, and, yeah. and she's quite a sensible girl. She's going off to university, so we wanted to stabilize her disease. And I think there was a bit of a discussion, and I did feel that anti-IL-1 was not the right way to go about it. So my plan was to add in methotrexate, but I just wanted to check whether this could have been a part of FMF, but it looks like it's just a, a different inflammatory arthritis. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Sika, sir. Sika, sir. Yes, thank you uh, for telling talk on this FMF. Quite interesting. And I think this is MS compliment you for uh, enlightening us on this problem. And any arthritis for that matter coming with this type of skin lesions, which are shown in the pictures, should arouse a suspicion of this type of situation, which you are coming across more than what we. And the treatment with cortin is sometimes, um, I mean, I don't think that is so good in our place. But I just want to put a question to you, which I asked your uh, previous speaker also. We have a Bechets who comes with oral lesions and he had intestinal Bechets. First, a manifestation not showing all the criteria, but he presented with, uh, or, I mean, uh, the blood picture of inflammation. With he went into uh, patients. I presented one of the mirror also this story. And he is uh, operated, he is doing well. Yesterday, his mother called me and told he is having one ulcer in the oral cavity. As it was told by Kishore also last time, you treat them with steroids. How long we should give them steroids? If at all we are going to give colchicine at a later stage, how long we should continue? Is it to be given for each episode or it should be given continuously for some time till you become asymptomatic or a prolonged use? Um, just sorry for, I didn't sometimes hear uh, about the case. Is this a Bechet or just uh, yes, all Bechet, the ulcers? Bechet. Yes, Nothing only one about or FMF, just no, Bechet disease no, no. and also having some, uh, sorry, no I, 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 I can't hear you. Just, he has uh, no other clinical ulcers. No. Yeah, only ulcers, no. Okay. In this period, you can um, you can give uh, steroids for for example for each attack for a um, week just and okay. but you, you should continue causing. Okay. Okay. That's Steroid will help. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vinod Kariya. Dr. Vinod. Vinod, are you there? I know Dr. Kosky has to attend another, another program around 9 p.m. Indian time. So she yeah. was with in a BC. So uh, Vinod, over to you, Dr. Vinod. Yeah, I, I don't have any questions, of course. Fantastic <laughs> talk. And, uh, and we, I mean, we do come across extremely rarely cases of FMF. Um, there was yes. one case that we published, uh, which was referred to us from the Christian Medical College in Vellut. I, I, I read I read this publication. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah but, but, uh, but they typically come with an ancestry uh, mostly from the Middle East or the Mediterranean. Yes, yes. I I, I, I read about it. Yes, he had an ancestry. Uh, Dr. Basan, this is uh, Kishore Wadia from Nottingham again. 
Um, I when I contacted Dr. Ozen, I mean, I I frequently ask my questions to Dr. Ozen. She's very helpful with the emails. She yes, 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 yes. She's and always. And I can now understand why she recommended you a name. Thank you, Benjamin, for that wonderful talk. We we were all very enlightened by the talk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Vinod. Now I uh, thank you, Dr. Ozge, for that wonderful talk. Now I invite Dr. M. G. Gita. Actually, M.D. Gita is the professor of pediatrics in Government Medical College, Calicut. She is the coordinator of this program for concluding the session. Over to you, Dr. Gita. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Osge, that was a, a really nice talk that you gave. And uh, as mentioned, we come across FMF very, very rarely. And um, yes. we are only now starting to focus on auto-inflammatory syndromes yes. as a cause yes, for sure. recurrent fever in children. So I have one small question for you. How often do you see uh, FMF in newborns? Is it common or do you come across it in neonates? Newborns? Uh, it's, it's, it is really rare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need some time uh, to to uh, to develop their you know clinic uh, presentations. Uh, but uh, we have patients, uh, we have infant patients having diagnosis of FMF for sure. But it is very rare in a neonatal period, and uh, we sometimes, uh, if we have patients like uh, peri periodic fevers in neonatal period, we we also you uh, think about other auto-inflammatory diseases. Okay, as you do. Right. Thank you. But sometimes our patients can have a family history or. Uh, so if they have a family history, uh, uh, I mean, I'm talking about, um, mm, for example, a month, a month, two months, three months uh, infants, uh, we can check their uh, genetic mutations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But and otherwise, uh, we usually think about other auto-inflammatory diseases as well. Okay. And uh, uh, what sort of problems does it lead to in pregnancy, does it really cause problems when a mother with FMF is pregnant? Uh, do they have more problems or is it less? Uh, I think it is the same, not much or not less, because they can continue coaching. It's not contraindicated and it's also uh, safe for the uh, fetus. Uh, so they don't usually have any problems. Right. Dr. P. Geeta, would you like to say something? Dr. Geeta? Uh, Dr. M. G. Geeta, uh, I think yeah. Dr. Geeta is not there, right? So it's... Oh, okay. Right, right. Dr. Okay. Sindhu is there. You can call Sindhu. Dr. Sindhu? Sindhu is also... Ah, Sindhu is there. Sindhu, uh, unmute yourself. Sindhu, Dr. Sindhu, you can unmute yourself. Gita, continue. Okay, okay. So uh, on behalf of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics at Calicut and the Department of Pediatrics at Government Medical College, Kori Kori, and uh, CSIR, IGIB, Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi, and the Foundation for Primary Immune Deficiency uh, Diseases. We are extremely thankful to you, Madam, for spending your valuable time with us in spite of your busy schedule. And actually, this is the fifth in a series uh, we are having over the last month on auto-inflammatory syndromes. And the idea is that uh, young pediatricians and practicing pediatricians would be um, more at home with uh, the realization that there are lots of patients. Uh, I wouldn't say lots, but there are children with auto-inflammatory syndromes who are as yet undiagnosed or diagnosed really late. And that really um, makes a difference, makes... Um, 
the start of treatment is delayed and they also have um, chronic problems like as you have referred to as amyloidosis. And uh, we do have a pediatric rheumatology clinic at our institute. And uh, we have children who are picked up from there as well as our pediatric immune deficiency clinic, as well as the general uh, pediatric wards. And I'm sure after this talk of yours, uh, we would be looking more carefully and finding more children with familial Mediterranean fever. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the delegates who have spent their time to come and be with us. And the next week, we have Dr. Marco Gattorno, who's going to talk about um, another uh, auto-inflammatory uh, syndrome, the cryopyranopathies. Uh, I'd also like to place on record my thanks to Dr. Kishore for all his help in arranging this series and also for being with us today. And uh, really, really thank all the senior faculty, our teachers, and all other pediatricians and students who have been with us today. And especially you, madam, it was a really uh, enlightening talk. Thank you. Dr. Very welcome. Thank, 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 thank you, you very you, much for inviting me. It was very really nice to meet you and to see you. And I hope that in the future, after the end of this pandemic, we can see uh, each other face to face in any meeting or so on. I don't know, but I hope. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.